Good morning and welcome to worship. We're here to be alive and to celebrate. And we listen to the words of 1 John 5, 4. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory. Hear that word? This is the victory that has overcome the world. It's good to be a winner. And it's good to be with winners. Christ Jesus in whom we have victory. Let's stand and celebrate that promise today. Still fresh. 
should move. And with the victory comes blessing. And this is our prayer. Lord, come thou fount, meaning pour out your blessing.
the guy that wrote those words was 22 when he wrote that hand. And there was a verse that I had never seen before of this hymn until late on Wednesday night. It never made it to any of our hymnals or any of our church singing. But guess what? This guy, this 22-year-old, saved the best for last. I want you to listen to the words first. Oh, oh. follow Jesus have so much in common on such a deep level. We cry out to the same Savior, pray to the same Father, citizens of the same kingdom, belonging to the same family, and all of us together share in the same hope of a future in heaven. I've found there is so much power in the moments when the church gathers to sing of that hope. And it's not just power to lift our souls and build our faith for the future, but also power that encourages us to live for that future today. When the disciples asked Jesus how we ought to pray, he said to pray to the Father, quote, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Time after time, Jesus showed us that to belong to the kingdom of heaven is not just a future hope, but a kingdom that we can be a part of today. We can walk in his spirit, stand in his victory, and move in his love today. This truth is why my song, Hymn Heaven, has two different choruses. One looks to the hope of our future in Jesus, and the other prays to let that hope fill our spheres of influence right now. The Apostle Paul, while in prison, writes to the church in Philippi amidst their own persecution that, quote, our citizenship is in heaven. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorites, wrote, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. 
Here are a few ways we can live today differently because of our future heavenly hope and our present kingdom mission. One, while reading Revelation 20, 1 through 7, imagine the beauty of what it will be like when we are finally home. Focus on the greatest joy of all, being united with Christ for all eternity. Two, make a commitment to pray the Lord's Prayer each morning as you plan out your day. Ask God how He might want to bring heavenly reality of His kingdom through you today. Three, be honest with God about the pain and longing in your heart in the midst of this broken world. Firmly place your hope in Jesus while experiencing the comfort of the Holy Spirit. My citizenship is not here in this place. My current home is, but my citizenship is in heaven. I can't wait to go home. That was Phil Wickham who wrote this next song. It was his hymn of heaven. And that's what we see.
phrase you learn in seminary Whew. man we talked this morning as a team do you ever pray for the Lord to come quickly the older I get the more I pray that Lord Jesus quickly come oh I'll miss some of you well that doesn't sound right Maybe if he comes today and takes me and then, then comes back later for you. I, I don't want to miss any of you. Oh, what a beautiful time. And what a beautiful time tomorrow in the 5 to 6 a.m. hour when a lot of you have to wake up earlier than normal. So if you're a kid that is going to school, whether you've started or will start tomorrow, I don't care what kind of grade you are in or what kind of grade you're going to get. Come up here. Come up here. Big, little, short, tall, skinny, not skinny. <laughs> Take a look. Now you have to look at them too. Now you are very important because what you're about to start tomorrow is very, very important. There's also somebody else here that may be just as important. So if you're a teacher, I want you to come up here as well. If you're teaching anything, anyone, anyones, come up here too. This is the unsung calling right here. I'm married to a teacher, so I can say that. There is a special place in that heaven we just sang about for teachers. Take a look at them. Now, there's one more category. If you're a parent of one of these kids or one of these teachers or both, you come up here because your role is just as important in the lives of these young people. You can find your kid. You can find another kid. You can choose one of your... Isn't that a neat picture? And speaking of the word picture, I hope one or more of you are currently taking a photo of this wherever you are, especially the balcony, that can uh, memorialize this for time to come. 
Everyone up here needs our prayers. You're the church, we're the church. This is the church. Most of us have had a lot more yesterdays than tomorrows. This is our future, and they need our prayers. Whether they're in a Christian school, in a public school, in a private school, in a home school, they need our prayers. So we're going to have a special time of prayer and blessing. And take a look. I want, I want these faces, well, the, the, the cute ones, etched etched in your mind that you not only pray for them this morning but you pray for them all throughout the year and these little and big guys they adore you you do not know the influence you, you have had on my kid your service doesn't end when you walk out the door Continue to pray, continue to love. And as we have this time of blessing and prayer, let's all be of one mind and one voice. I'm going to ask David to lead us in this time. Will you guys raise your hands out towards these amazing teachers, families, kids as we pray? God, I pray that you would just cover the school year. We know that our citizenship is in heaven, but we're ambassadors here. God, I pray that you would protect kids, that you would give wisdom and strength to teachers, that they would have more energy at the end of the year than they did at the beginning of the year, that you would fill them with strength and hope and wisdom, that you would give parents and kids the strength to continue on, wisdom and peace and patience. God, I pray that you would fill us up as parents to pour out, teachers to pour out, not just the parents and teachers, but the volunteers that support and pray for and love on these kids and teachers all year long. God, I pray that you'd give us ways to support the teachers, the parents, the administrators, and give them wisdom in dealing with challenges. But God, I pray that it would be a year that everyone would look back on and say, this was one of the best, and they'll only get better. God, I pray for children to walk out of classrooms every day and say, my life was improved and impacted by the words of these teachers and the encouragement that we received. God, that these would be years that are the ones that are foundational, the kids would remember to be able to bless you in your name yes. because we get to have an impact everywhere that we go. God, I pray for blessing, for wisdom, for hope, and peace over all of those that are in here that support whichever school they're in, whichever house they're in. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I wasn't smart enough to bring my Bible up here when I came, so I got to go back to my seat. Give me just a minute. In the meantime, if you guys don't know, if you're a Sunday school teacher uh, of any age bracket in the church, would you stand up real quick just so people can see who's leading a Sunday school class? Yeah. Amen. So we have Sunday school classes for every age bracket, and it's how we connect beyond our service time where we get to dig into the Word together to, to build relationships with one another. Uh, it's one of the easiest ways to get plugged into the church because you're spending time in conversation about what's going on in the life of the church and how Scripture applies to your own life. Uh, along with that, in about two weeks, we're going to start our youth and children's program back up. So that's K-5 through five and then 6-12. through 12. Um, and that happens on Tuesday nights from 6 to 7.30, uh, and it's like a mini VBS. We feed the kids, we play games, crafts, we, we worship together, uh, we study scripture together, um, and have an absolute blast doing that. So if you're interested in coming to that, uh, it's just two Tuesdays away, um, so week and a half, week and under. Um, and if you're interested in volunteering for that, come and see me. There's places to get plugged in as we look to see what our youth and children's ministry uh, leadership team is going to look like for the year. Uh, kids, you guys are dismissed to go to Children's Church. If you're new, Children's Church is as typically everybody uh, fifth grade and under can head down uh, to the fellowship hall. And as you can see, like they know the drill, you can just send yours on, they're following. For everybody else, we are going to pick back up 
uh, in 1 Timothy. We'll be in chapter 3 today uh, with a small little speed bump on the way to chapter 3 that we're going to discuss as we look towards what godly training looks like, how we're supposed to develop as a church, how we're supposed to develop as individuals in Christ-likeness or towards Christ's likeness. Uh, so we're going to be there. If you've got a Bible, flip to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3. If you don't, there's some in the pews. I, I think there's Wi-Fi. You can use your phone, hotspot yourself, call your phone carrier, tell them you can't get signal, whatever. We'll get it worked out. How you guys doing this morning? I hope so. I absolutely loved worship this morning. Uh, Chip, if nobody has told you yet today, I love you, buddy. And I have really enjoyed worship uh, this morning. Especially the thought of binding my wandering heart to him. Because goodness is it prone to wander. If anybody has lived a day in Christ, that means you believe Jesus is God and has made payment for your sin. That he was dead, buried, and resurrected so that you also can have newness of life. If, if you belong to Jesus this morning because you believe that this morning and you've walked a day as a Christian, then you know full well that that song probably needs to be sung every morning after your Lord's prayer about please your will here on earth as well. But just bind me to you. Keep my heart where it should be throughout the day because it's so, so easy to just stray off from where it's supposed to be. And it might not be huge things, but the little things turn into huge things real quick. It usually starts with attitude, right? My attitude is off, so my actions start to mirror, and then the end result or consequences is a place that I never intended to be. Anybody ever wake up grumpy? Uh, yeah, some of y'all are morning people. Don't talk to me before my coffee. Coffee saves lives, I'm just saying. This morning, we're going to be looking at a series of instructions that typically makes people grumpy. And there's nothing I can do about it. I'm not going to change what Scripture says for anybody's attitude's sake, certainly not my own. Uh, so we're going to read through a series of scripture when Paul is telling Timothy, here's what you're supposed to be doing when it comes to planting, edifying, or, or uh, establishing the leaders in a brand new church. He's speaking about a group of people that need to understand that whether we like it or not, there is a set order and expectation that God has of his people and of the church. And it's always going to clash with the expectation and set order of those outside of the church. And in fact, the, the closer we get to Jesus' return, the more evident that clash will become. It won't be any softer. Leading people through that clash through the difference between God's expectations of the church or Christians and the difference in the expectation of what's allowed in the world as it continues to grow, leaders have to be in love with the belief through faith that the instructions given are for our good. Because if we know how to give a good gift when a child asks, how much more so than your father? who is in heaven, capable of giving you a good gift, which is exactly what Scripture is, so that you would know, without a doubt, how to connect with him and to stay connected with him as he teaches you to bind your heart to who he is. Now listen, leadership comes in all different kinds of forms, fashions, and different levels. There are some loud things in leadership over the years that I'd share with you. The Marine Corps has some leadership values. It's honor, courage, and commitment. I tell my kids all the time, I value commitment. Uh, unfortunately, even if it's just a little bit wild or dangerous, I'm like, no, you said, let's get it. They're like, you said it, we're committed, let's do it. John Maxwell is a huge name in, in Christian leadership circles. 
has a couple of leadership values that he pushes, connection, confidence, and competence. Tony Robbins, who's a big name in leadership projects and maybe self-help books who I wouldn't necessarily ascribe to, would project something like service, passion, and vision. I'm reading all of these off to you so that you get kind of a broad picture of the typical human response to what they expect a good leader should have, do, or be. All of these ideologies may make for a dynamic business leader, but what about the church? The church is not designed to run in that fashion. It's designed to stick out and be different. And I know there are some pieces that intersect with each other because of the laws of the land we live in. But here's what Jesus projects throughout all of his teaching on earth for a leader. That they would be humble first. That they would not have to demand respect. That they would be teachable that a Christian leader would be a servant first, and that everything done would be done to the glory of God, not to the glory of them. Those things seem very straightforward and very simple and easy to understand, but far more difficult to actually produce in a human life because human nature does not produce any of these things. Fortunately, by the grace of God and the indwelling Holy Spirit, some of these things may manifest out in your life, but it would have to be in connection to Christ daily, all the time, as a constant mindset, because whenever that mindset drops, we step in. First Timothy lays some core qualifications of the leaders of God's people, the leaders of a church, leaders of a religious group specifically those that would be called an overseer, those who would be held to a higher standard than every other Christian on the planet. And you say, well, that doesn't seem right. Well, we're getting ready to lead. I was telling somebody yesterday, or that was a couple days ago now, that was interested in getting involved in vocational Ministry, meaning they want their whole life or their job to revolve around teaching the Bible to somebody else. Like this is, this would be everything for them. They would quit their current job and they would become a vocational leader in a church setting. It's an interesting point of fact for that person and oddly enough for somebody else sitting here. You would be stepping into the only job that God said, I would rather tie a millstone around your neck and drown you in the depths of the ocean than for you to get it wrong. Yeah, it's got some weight. Which is why humility has to be the start of that venture. Because the risk of getting that job wrong, which is highly likely from the human standpoint, has such a weight to it, an eternal one. And so the people that God decides should be leading a church has nothing to do with how dynamic of a leader they are. Has nothing to do with them being charismatic or likable by others or approachable, sort of. It has nothing to do with their business abilities or prowess. It has everything to do with emptying yourself of everything you are so that it can be replaced with what Jesus wants to see. And so I'm going to read a portion of this out, and it's going to start in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 lays a very small piece of this foundation before it gets into the set qualifications. And, and I, want you to be able to, I want you to be able to see this. And I'll explain this picture in just a second. 1 Timothy chapter 2. At the end of this, or near the end of this, there's a section in here that Paul starts speaking about who should be teaching and why. In verse 11 and verse 12 of 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Does that sound like 2023 to anybody? 
And you say, well, gee, that's uh, I'm out if that's what this church believes. If that's the case, wait till the end. And let's have a conversation. As you look around churches throughout America, women are usually the ones that are in attendance more and are usually volunteering more. And it's an absolute loss that stems all the way back from Genesis chapter 3 where a declaration is given to Eve where it says, you shall desire your husband and he shall rule over you. That desire is not a physical, intimate desire. That already happens when God says, be fruitful and multiply. It's an innate design that's built into each human. That's not what that's talking about. What that's talking about is you are now going to be ruled over instead of co-leaders. So listen, as much as the rest of the world hates this, a female pastor is not supposed to exist. And it's not because they're not talented. It's not because they're not smart, capable, or even Spirit-filled, because every believer who believes in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is given the same spirit, but they're not given the same authority or the same function within the body of believers. The body is made up of each individual part performing the function that God had designed so that it functions freely without sin, declaring the goodness and the grace and the love of God. Whenever this does not happen and one piece of the body performs a function it's not designed to perform, then we start to struggle and the gospel and the truth of scripture starts to break down and becomes subject to personal interpretation. That cannot be allowed. So listen, when it comes to leading the church, it is supposed to be led by a male. I did not make up the rules. I didn't choose what gender I was born. These things happened naturally for me because that's what God designed. So here we are. If you fit into a different boat, that's not my fault either. I cannot fix this. The picture on the screen is the Southern Baptist Convention. It's their annual meeting where they voted. And one of the weightier issues that they voted on for the Southern Baptist Convention, which our church is Southern Baptist, was whether or not ladies should be ordained ministers of the church. It had been happening for several years, and this year they voted that the answer should be no, because it doesn't match what Scripture requires of each individual. And so now the SBC doesn't back female pastors anymore which I'm grateful for because that means we're stepping closer into what this book says. And it's difficult. It's not popular. It's going to clash with the rest of the world. But it's not meant to be belittling. It's meant to be edifying. That means spiritually equipping and lifting up so that you can perform the function God designed you to perform. So many people in our modern culture give away God's design and try to be something else, completely missing the gift of how he created you. Instead of celebrating the fact that Psalm 139 says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. That's where we're supposed to live. So don't miss here when we get into this, but this needs to be a piece that is said. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 starts, It's a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. And it certainly is. But I would venture to say it'll be one of the weightiest things somebody ever endeavors to do. So guys, if you're thinking, hey, sweet, I get to be the one in charge, you sure do. Whether you are re ready or not, here it comes. If you are not in vocational leadership in church, you are still not off the hook, guys. What was given to Christ has been given to us, and the design from the beginning was that you would spiritually lead anyone around you that God puts in your path, that you would take up the mantle, so to speak, because he's given you his spirit, and you would step into spiritually leading others. And there's only two directions, right? The entire 
design is everlasting in spirit, where the physical part, because of the curse of sin, is death now. And so everything you do in leading somebody else, in a personal relationship, in a friendship, in a business place, for children, in a vocational setting, everything will help push somebody towards Jesus or away from him. Because of that, God places an awful lot of weight on who should be allowed to instruct other people. And I don't want you to mishear me. I don't arrogantly stand here and read out the qualifications because I think I match all of them. In fact, I know the very first one. I don't. So what do you do with that? Let me read it to you. 1 Timothy chapter 3. It's a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. Because of that, verse 2, an overseer then must be above reproach. Well, that's miserable. Because I have some people who I'm friends with and other people that don't like me at all. And it's the concept or the thought behind reproach, right? That there would be nothing somebody could say bad about you, but my heart wanders. I struggle. And so obviously, some people are treated better than others because of how they treat me. And in the end, it ends up creating broken relationships instead of built up relationships in unity as the church should be. As a result, I am not above reproach. And I'm guessing there are probably several people sitting in here this morning that are not above reproach. So how in the world do you fix that? Well, Matthew chapter 18 has got a pretty healthy start to it. You could apologize, admit you're wrong, or go and address your brother's fault with them face to face. Once that's done... Open repentance and prayer together about things not going so well helps remove reproach from God's people and then only adhering to what this book says about how we should act or how we should worship or how we should serve because when you stray away from it, you invite reproach. For every person whether you aspire to the office of an overseer or not, that's the same as saying pastor or elder in a church. If you aspire to that or not, start your day off asking God, am I a reproach to anybody? Am I the reason somebody else struggles? Does somebody else have an issue with me. And if the case is yes, then Paul says, in as much as depends on you, be peaceable to all men. Go and try to fix it. It also references the fact that if you have a lifestyle that grossly clashes with what Scripture says, it must be changed entirely before you are given the office of an overseer of the church. You cannot play with sin and still claim that you should be the person involved with leading others scripturally. It must be repented of and removed, even if your life is now defined by a daily repentance of and removing of, you cannot claim God is okay with what is sin and then try to step in and lead other people to the same hell that you would be going to without Christ and surrendering to him. Listen, people say things all the time, like, well, I believe in Jesus. Scripture makes it clear, so do the demons, so does Satan, and it scares them to death. And yet so often, spiritual leaders love playing with the thing that they've decided that God has created them to be without giving themselves entirely to him. If it's sinful, it needs to go or else your service will be of no effect, and he might as well throw you in the ocean. The second piece of this may be also be very hard to hear. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. 
Now listen, I'll tell you right now, you can go on Google or you can open up a seminary book depending on what school you choose or what denomination you belong to, what faith background you were brought up under, and you will get a myriad of explanations to what this means. There'll be no end to somebody trying to justify the existence of sin according to what this means. The easiest explanation for this when this book was written was polygamy, meaning you can't have more than one wife in marriage living in your house with you. You're not designed to have multiple partners. You're designed for a man and a woman to leave their mother and father, to be joined together as one flesh, and to stay that way until death do you part. That is a cultural explanation of a biblical truth. It's why we say till death do you part. The covenant or contract in the relationship does not end because man nullifies it. That contract is still valid because man wasn't the one that put it in place. God was. And you cannot praise the Lord. You cannot undo the covenants that God creates. Man, am I excited about that. If mankind could undo the covenants that God creates, then you could literally remove yourself from salvation whenever you felt like it. Like, you understand the weight of what people are playing with in this? The husband of one wife, in its original context, was to say, you cannot have polygamy, but you can also not have a variety of marriage, divorced, marriage, divorced, marriage, divorced. Unfortunately, spiritually speaking, if you aspire to be an overseer, if you have been married and then divorced, legally you may have been separated on a human standpoint. Spiritually, you are not. You are still bound to that person until one of the spouses passes away. And the divorce itself is a shame but not a sin. You can read through. Remarriage, however, that's a second wife or a second husband. So for the guys that are interested in aspiring to be an overseer, you can only ever always have a single wife until death do you part. Once a spouse passes away, Scripture makes it very clear that you can enter into another marriage because the first marriage was fulfilled in its entirety. Fortunately, God makes it very clear that his covenants will be fulfilled in their entirety, not just in part. Not just this piece of belonging to Jesus is the best I will ever see. The covenants that he's made in the blood of Christ is for eternity. And I will see more of this covenant when he comes to take me home. And I'm grateful for it. So until then, it is just one wife. It is not a remarried or a multiple remarried. It is just an original. Then it says they must be temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and skillful in teaching. These words are important. Temperate means long-suffering. If you're not willing to take the hit day after day after day and have somebody say something negative about you or your family day after day after day or wade through the rest of the world that hates submitting to Jesus and his word and fighting with that day after day, then this isn't the job for you. Taking your time with people being self-controlled and able to resist temptation, being respectable, your actions match your words, or being hospitable, welcoming to strangers and guests and taking care of those around you. These are all important pieces of what it means to be a leader of the church or to be ordained as a pastor in a church or an elder of a church. Skillful in teaching. Not all elders have the same function, but every single one should be able to teach Scripture. So make it a practice. 
Make it a habit of getting involved in a teaching ministry somewhere and plugging in because like you saw all the Sunday school teachers, right? I, I'm the teaching elder of this church, but I can't go to every one of those Sunday schools and lead them. I cannot be in more than one place at one time. I, I can't lead youth and children at the same time. I can't lead all the Sunday school classes at the same time. An elder or an overseer or a pastor of a church must be skillful in teaching. So if you're aspiring to the work, if you're, if you're interested in being a pastor of a church, if you're getting some education in that, make it a practice to teach what you are learning so that you become skillful in teaching what God is teaching you. So that you can recreate for other people the lessons he's giving you as you pray for understanding and you read through scripture. Make it a point to practice teaching. The next piece, and, and we're almost done because they're coming back in. Not overindulging in wine. Let me read this out to you. In, in verse 3, it says, Not overindulging in wine, not a bully, but gentle, not contentious, free from the love of money. These are all personal character traits that you bring to the table in Christ. It can't all be about cash. It can't all be about forcing your will on other people uh, it, you cannot be overindulging in wine you can't be a bully you have to be somebody who is willing to serve be humble before other people it's not all about you anyway it's all about Jesus and then take whatever he has given you and apply it to the service of the people that he has given you to serve I'll read the rest of this chapter out, and then we'll stop there for the day. In verse 4, he must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. So listen, this is an important piece. Kids can be kids, but you should have a loving, respectful relationship with your children where no means no. And they're interested in the things that you're interested in when you're teaching them about Jesus or showing them how to do something in the house or playing sports. Like, there should be an active engagement, spiritually first, followed up by physical things. When that happens in a household, then children are submissive to their parents. Now, it doesn't mean they're not going to have a, a wild day doesn't mean that they're not going to make dumb choices that you've made earlier in life and tried to keep them from. It'll happen in part. But the end result of a household shouldn't be that the dad sits there chewing his mashed potatoes, not saying a word at the table while mom's giving everybody the riot act for not cleaning their room or listening to things, and the dad is of no help. Like, you cannot be an absentee ballot. There's no mail-ins. you got to be present. If a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And listen, that's all things. If your wife runs the household, that's not the design that God put in place supposed to be a co-leader with you, supposed to be your partner in crime, so to speak, supposed to be doing all things together. But listen, spiritually, dads are responsible. Husbands are responsible. So when it comes to, well, I don't know, like, <laughs> if you spend time with people long enough, I think whoever is in control of the house becomes very plain to you. Unfortunately, I think for a lot of houses, that's probably the ladies, which is why it's so difficult to be a man leading the church. Because the ladies are also in charge of the church. And you can say, no, I'm not in charge of the church. But listen, if anything ever happens that you don't like and you start chirping in somebody's ear in the background, guess what happens? Something gets changed, doesn't it? It's a dangerous precedence to set. Make sure that whatever we're asking for or requiring from others who are leading around us, that it is biblically minded or else it's got to go. Same thing with your household. 
not a new convert, meaning it can't be somebody who is brand new to Christ. They're still a baby. They haven't learned. They haven't grown. They're, they're still in a process of being discipled so that he will not become conceited and fall into condemnation incurred by the devil. Listen, if somebody becomes a brand new Christian and because of it they get put in a place of leadership, the thought is by default, oh, I'm so much better than everyone else around me. Look at me go, I'm in charge. And that conceit is the same thing that got Satan tossed out of heaven. He must have a good reputation with those outside the church. So listen, here's another piece too. If you go to a church and they raise this Bible and they yell and scream about everybody's sins and nobody who is not a Christian wants to spend a single minute of their time with your pastor, you're at the wrong church. They may be speaking the truth, but it is not in love. And a truth spoken not in love is just as damaging as a lie. Because they don't hear Christ, they only hear a bully. You should have a good relationship with those outside the church. If you say, listen, I, I don't hang out with anybody that's not Christian. Well, if you're the spiritual leader, that's your design. If you're a Christian, you're supposed to go evangelize. You're not supposed to become the world. You're supposed to be in it, though. So spend time with people who aren't believers and start speaking to them in love about their life. And as you develop that relationship, they may actually hear something they didn't hear before. Have a good relationship with those outside the church so that he will not fall into disgrace and the snare of the devil. I'm going to stop us there. Next week, we'll get into some qualifications for being deacons, and then I'll explain the difference between elders and deacons and others who are in the church using their spiritual gifts to serve the church but aren't necessarily in a leadership platform. I hope that makes sense today. Listen, God's design is for men to be the spiritual leaders. Timothy is the product of some beautiful women spiritual leaders who he then submitted to a male leader when he came along. So I'm not saying that if you're the only light in your area that you should put yourself under a basket or not show because you are a city on a hill. Your, your design is to glorify God everywhere you are. So you keep glorifying God while you're waiting for the men to catch up. But as they catch up, you must submit to their leadership and make the exchange instead of always treating them while they're trying to grow like they are somehow beneath you. Listen, when I started getting involved in ministry things, Aaron was the spiritual leader of our house, hands down. I didn't want much to do with it. I wasn't real excited about it. We didn't do a whole lot with it growing up. It just wasn't my thing. As I stepped into serving others and obeying Jesus as a, a baby believer, Aaron did not lord her superior knowledge over me. I didn't grow up singing hymns. I didn't grow up listening to children's Sunday school lessons. I was well behind the power curve. And she simply let me learn and to let me lead in that learning instead of what I watch some couples do where the, the wife knows a whole lot more and they belittle the husband as he's trying to come up. Because if we do, then we still force them to submit to us and we keep control and authority and push it back down. That cannot happen. For the guys in the room, if you aspire to spiritually lead well and you don't have a clue what that looks like in your life and you just want some discipleship, another guy coming alongside, let's do it. You can teach me some scripture, I'll teach you some scripture, and we'll just spend some time together. I'm going to pray for us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your design in a household, in a church, in a life. You promised that it's good. And when we submit to your leadership, when we fall in line with your leading, Lord, it is good. It's beautiful to watch, and it's healthy both spiritually and physically. So, Father, help us to be a people who live beyond reproach. 
Help us to work towards your good and not just our own. Help us to take the gifts and the time and the talents that you have given us to serve you and to serve others with it. And help us to enjoy the thought of submitting. It is one of the most beautiful things we get to do as believers is to submit to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because it takes all the stress off of us. Father, help us to serve and to live and to follow well so that the gospel would go out. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What a passage. And it's convicting to me. It was the first Sunday in August in 1986 that I began ministry. That was 37 years ago. Ow! And I've done this, I've missed maybe 24 Sundays in those 37 years. And the more I do this, the more I realize I don't know anything. And I've read Second or 1 Timothy 3 a whole bunch of times. So when I don't know the answer, I'm thankful I know the one who does. And that we have a hope. And that hope is living and his word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Let's sing to our living hope. Will you stand?
Same. 